Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. As you probably know by now, this September I went to Egypt and back with Adept Expeditions, a trip that was led by NEXT alongside Doug from History for Granite and Keith Hamilton who writes the fantastic series of Layman's Guides. It really was a trip of a lifetime. The tour group was amazing. Everyone had a fantastic time, we always felt safe and looked after, and soon I will be doing a tour overview where I'll show you all the amazing things we saw. I was inside the Sphinx enclosure at sunrise, went inside so many amazing temples in Upper Egypt, saw the enormous stone boxes in the Serapium, visited the Aswan Quarry in Elephantine Island, entered six pyramids including the Great, Red and Bent Pyramids, and also the Pyramid of Menkore. Away from the history there were also many memorable moments, like the horse and carriage ride to Edfu, which was crazy and hilarious in equal measure. There were the boat rides where local kids were hanging on with surfboards, and serenading us with songs by Shakira. And I can't forget the young woman on Elephantine Island who almost sold out of all of her goods simply because she was so kind. Everyone was buying something, and she even waved us off. But all of that, all of these fantastic experiences will be for another video. In this video I'm taking us into the Pyramid of Menkore, easier to navigate than the Great Pyramid, Bent Pyramid and Red Pyramid, but it's still not easy if you've got bad knees and a bad back like me. The Pyramid of Menkore may be small in comparison to others, but it's arguably the most elegant pyramid at Giza, with its eye-catching granite casing stones, the beautiful panel chamber, the curved granite roof of the burial chamber, and the interesting layout of passages and chambers. In this video I won't be giving you a full detailed history and description of this pyramid, because I really just want to take you through the inside. But please do download and read Keith Hamilton's amazing guide to this pyramid, because it really is the perfect companion. And I should give a huge shout out to Keith because on meeting him and spending 10 days with him, I have to say he's an absolute star. So knowledgeable, he puts me to shame. He's very, very funny and a good lad to have on tour. His guides really are a gift to the world. So here we are on the Giza Plateau, sun beating down on us and as always it was incredibly hot. Almost too hot for an Englishman. It costs 150 Egyptian pounds to enter this pyramid, which is about $5 or 4 British pounds, and I found this surprisingly cheap. For reference, it's $20 or 16 British pounds to enter the Great Pyramid, and sadly Khafre's Pyramid was closed. So you reach the entrance, and you can see this by the smooth granite casing stones. You can see the unfinished granite to the left and to the right, including some with bosses still protruding. Getting inside on the north face of the pyramid, and you do need to be bent in half. It may not look too challenging by looking at this, and it's not compared to the bent pyramid, but together with the humidity it is very tiring. What you can't see in this video is the intense humidity. It hits you and there's no way to escape it. It does make filming inside the pyramid extremely difficult, but I did my best. So this is all just tunneled. Yeah. So if it did this, why did they need the put a big pit at the bank pyramid map and just tunnels through. That's a good point. And That's a very good point. They were tunnelers, they were never great pit people. This passageway has been cut through the natural limestone bedrock, and it's far shorter than the other entrance passages at Giza and Dashaw. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Nearly there. Nearly there, peeps. Nearly there. Nearly there, peeps. Then you can stand up like that. After leaving the descending passageway, we reach the panel chamber. You can see the palace facade decoration all around. Thankfully, you can stand up inside quite comfortably, with the room being more than two meters in height. No, no, no. Well, we don't go to the reconstruction. This was the sludge. There was a big. Originally, when Perrin came in here, there was a massive granite block that filled up the whole length of this chamber. Really? Yeah. Uh, and that there is the beautifully cut granite lintel we pass under next. As you can see, there's a half round drum carved into it. And there's Keith. So, whoever put that block in, how are you going to get the coffin in? There's something against this. It's interesting. So, so you put the coffin in the block? Yeah, so the, that the block wouldn't have been original. It wouldn't have been original. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And now a look back up the descending passageway to the outside, so you can see exactly where we've come from. This is pretty certain. There has been a lot of restoration in this area. Under the lintel we then enter the portcullis area and again a lot of restoration has been done. This area has been damaged and without the aid of diagrams it is quite hard to understand the architectural features. The 3D pictures that are published in Keith's guide are very helpful. We then enter the passage from the portcullis chamber to the upper chamber. This one is easy to navigate. Its height is 1.78 meters, so no backbending this time. Entering the upper chamber, and we can see the post holes that are cut into the limestone walls. And these could be later additions, but I think they are in fact original. I could talk for hours about this chamber, the largest inside the pyramid, being more than 14 meters in length, but now I'm just giving you a brief overview. Turning around and you can see the entrance I've just walked through. And above it is the blind passage that ends inside the masonry. Keith believes that this was used in the pyramid's construction and sadly I couldn't get to see inside. And well, it's not allowed anyway. Pause it there and that there is a smooth stone and it looks to be the original limestone floor level of the chamber, which really is a good reference point. At the end we can see a rectangular indentation on the floor. It looks like a place you would position a sarcophagus. But whether a sarcophagus was ever inserted, we really don't know. This could have been the plan A for the pyramid, to place the coffer right here, and then there was a change in plan to build the burial chamber beneath. It could also be a contingency, if the king died before the burial chamber was finished. I really don't know. Maybe it was simply a decoy, a way to throw off potential grave robbers. Through this gated area, and we can see the tops of granite roof beams, and these cover the burial chamber below. This passage was likely cut to get the granite beams into position, and could have also been used to get the sarcophagus into the chamber. Now we head down the second descending passageway towards the burial chamber. This passage was originally lined with masonry, and it was blocked up with granite and limestone, and there was another granite portcullis at the end. On the left we can see a cutout in the limestone, likely done to help with the turning of large objects into the niche chamber, this chamber on the right. This part of the pyramid is now locked shut, but thankfully we can see inside. It was likely some kind of storage room, although we don't know its function with any certainty. Today we can see muon detection plates inside. 
For me, this was really great to see, and hopefully someday soon, we can have muon scan results for this pyramid as well. It'll just be a matter of time. Turn to the left and we enter the granite line burial chamber. What are you saying about this? It's 6.62 meters long and 2.64 meters in width. It did feel pretty small inside, far smaller than the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid, but it was extremely well made. The masonry looks perfect, and the curvature of the granite roof is amazing. Just for reference, the lowest course of granite rests on natural limestone bedrock. As you can see, part of the floor is missing, just as it was when it was rediscovered in the 19th century. There was once a beautifully decorated basalt sarcophagus inside, situated against the western wall. Sadly, this now lies at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. It was taken to Britain by boat in the 19th century, but before reaching its destination, the boat sank. I do hope an effort is made one day to relocate it and bring it back to the pyramid. A fragment of the sarcophagus still exists and is currently inside the British Museum, item EA6646. Now we're heading back up the lower passageway that was once plugged up. And on reaching the top we can see a box, which I assume contains more muon scanning equipment. You can see the natural layering in the limestone bedrock, which gives a beautiful natural pattern to the chamber. The room really did feel quite special, and it did feel very large. Now I'm heading back out, back towards the portcullis chamber. This damaged lintel is the entrance into the portcullis chamber. And there you can see the grooves for the granite slabs. Here on the right we can see some of the reconstructed masonry and also the damage on the other side. And there we can see where the beams would have been inserted to support the portcullis mechanism, as per the diagrams by Keith Hamilton. Here's a couple of nice shots I took of the panel chamber, which really show the beauty of this little room. We can also see a piece of broken granite on the floor, its original purpose unknown, but likely related to the portcullis. And now we're heading out of the pyramid. By this time I'm sweating uncontrollably, and well, I'm shattered. Looking back at the footage, and going inside and out of pyramid passages really looks so easy, but I promise you it's not. And that wobble was me banging my head. Never film when leaving a pyramid. And again. 
and I've still got the lumps. On coming out and seeing the Khafre Pyramid in all its splendour was quite a sight to behold, and Giza was really as amazing as I imagined. Back on the ground that I panned down the entirety of the pyramid from ground level, ending with this famous granite casing stone with two bosses still protruding. To the left of the entrance on the smooth granite, and we can see hieroglyphs that have been cut into the stone, and these are thought to have been done in the 19th dynasty by Prince Kemwazet, son of Ramesses the Great. It mentions Menkore by name, and says he died on the 23rd day of summer, but no year is given. Kemwazet may have been the man that smoothed the casing stones around the entrance, meaning that this wasn't an original feature of the pyramid. We also went into the mortuary temple on the eastern side, and even though dilapidated, it was quite spectacular. And then we went to the start of the old causeway that runs off to the east. All of this will be for a future video, as there really is so much to say about the pyramids associated structures. So that was a brief look into Menkore's pyramid, using footage that I recorded just a few days ago, and you'll hopefully be happy to learn, I have hours and hours of footage from dozens of incredible sites across Egypt, which I'm sure will keep me going for a very long time. My visit to Egypt really was a trip of a lifetime, and NEXT and Adept Expeditions really were incredible. So if you want to see Egypt just like I did, do check out his website. I've linked it below in the description. The whole trip was truly magnificent, and nobody in the entire group was disappointed. Egypt really was magical and amazing, and although I've only just got back, I can't wait to return. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.